our next speaker is Marjorie Nguenya. Marjorie is a leadership coach, author, and non-executive director to financial services and not-for-profit organizations. She believes in the power of possibility and helping professionals to excel by shedding limiting beliefs. She is past president of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, IFOA, and was the first IFOA president to be based outside the UK, the third female and the first person of color. She was the founding executive director of the African Leadership University School of Insurance, an industry-driven initiative to deepen insurance talent on the African continent. Prior roles include being a member of, of the Group Executive Committee of Liberty Group in South Africa, playing the role of Chief Strategist and Chief Risk Officer of Old Mutual's African Operations. Marjorie is an actuary and holder of a Sloan Masters of Leadership and Strategy from the London Business School. She is passionate about talent development and has driven her time to teach undergraduate and postgraduate actuarial students at universities in Europe, Asia and Africa. Do you know something? Haha, <laughs> this is trying to multitask. I have, um, I'm going to give you guys a 15 minute break. I've forgotten on the schedule I sent. I did say I'm giving you guys a coffee break. So ha, apologies for that, everybody. I'm giving everyone a, a 15 minute break. Can we come back here at um, 20 past 12? Just go and stretch your legs. I know I was like really getting into it. And then I said, oh my gosh, I did put in a little bit of a break time there. Let's come back at 20 past 12. Um, and we will hear from Marjorie and Emmanuel, our last two speakers for the day. Get a cup of coffee, stretch your legs, do some squats or something to get that blood flowing. Now our health is our wealth. We came to learn about money, but we've got to keep moving at the same time. I'm so sorry. I got you. Okay. What are you doing? This African typical narrative of, oh, my grandfather used to have buses. And then it's like, what happened to all that wealth? You know, let that wealth move on from generation to generation. Now I'm just going to go back and introduce our uh, next couple of speakers who are our last speakers um if i can find that presentation again hold on okay Our next speaker is Marjorie Nguenya. Marjorie is a leadership coach, author, and non-executive director to financial services and not-for-profit organizations. She believes in the power of possibility and helping professionals to excel by shedding limiting beliefs. She is past president of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries, IFOA, and was the first IFOA president to be based outside the UK, the third female and the first person of colour. She was the founding executive director of the African Leadership University School of Insurance, an industry-driven initiative to deepen insurance talent on the African continent. Prior roles include being a member of, of the Group Executive Committee of Liberty Group in South Africa, playing the role of Chief Strategist and Chief Risk Officer of Old Mutual's African Operations. Marjorie is an actuary and holder of a Sloan Masters of Leadership and Strategy from the London Business School. She is passionate about talent development and has driven her time to teach undergraduate and postgraduate actuarial students at universities in Europe, Asia and Africa. Emmanuel Bolade is a fellow member of the Association of Chartered Certified Accountants. He arrives with two decades of experience in financial management.
Blue chip organizations have utilized his knowledge and skills in banking, automobile and energy industries and government in Nigeria and the UK. An avid lover of God, Emmanuel's passion is for the church to evangelize by dominating in industry and business. Over to you, Marjorie. Hello, greetings Hello. to you. <laughs> so, Thank you very much. Sorry, hold on. Hold on, hold on. I don't know what is open here. Sorry. Where the, there we go. <laughs> yeah, we're walking in the I know, that's it. I think abundance is here. Thank exactly. you. <laughs> Thank you, Tendai. So I'm talking to all of you today about the role planning plays in determining your future. And in particular, I'm talking about creating personal visions. But first, I want to start with a caveat that may sound counterintuitive, but if you bear with me, it will become clearer. And that is letting go of attachment to outcomes. We become free when we release attachment to outcomes so that instead we can be more present in the doing, the being, the relating rather than what might come in the future. So if your life will only be happy or successful when certain boxes have been ticked, when you've saved a certain amount of money or bought that dream house, you'll find yourself being a very dissatisfied person because nothing is guaranteed or owed to us. So I'm a believer that life unfolds as it should and that everything happens for a reason. So as I talk about how to go about your plans, do bear in mind the notion that the spirit of my words is that you focus on pursuing what is meaningful in your life and give that your undivided attention, but to enjoy the journey as well, while not always fixating on the destination. And this is well captured by a quote from Ram Das, which says, to become free of attachment means to break the link identifying you with your desires. The desires continue, they are a part of the dance of nature, but a renunciate no longer thinks that he is his desires. So what is a personal vision? Often my clients want advice on decisions they want to make and many of them are trying to make these decisions without an appreciation of their own context. That is, what is it that they want out of life in its various dimensions and what is meaningful to them? So imagine setting out on a trip and all you know is that you're heading to a place where there are lakes. At your destination, you're going to find lots of water. It's going to be beautiful. Well, where are you going? Tanzania, Canada, Switzerland? If the destination is unclear, then the path towards it is almost likely going to be vague. And yes, it's true that you may visit very enchanting places along the way, but never quite reach the place that you intended, except by happy coincidence. And in any event, a lot about life is indeed about the journey. So it's not to take away from that point. But if on the other hand, you have a sense of clarity about where you're heading, you're going to resist the urge to go down attractive routes which offer interesting detours but take you further away from your goals. Many of us are on autopilot. We're living the lives that we believe we should be responsibly living and doing the things that we believe we ought to be doing. In my own life, I moved away from my corporate career, which is what I believed for many, many years was what was expected of me. It was how I'd been socialized as I was growing up. So perhaps we feel content with these lives uh, in some shape or form. And if that's you, perhaps what I have to say today doesn't apply as much to you, but let's see. But if you are trying to design a life, a way of life that is authentically yours and it's custom made for your interests, strengths and aspirations, then a personal vision might be what you need. There are many ways that you could carve up this personal vision and you could consider setting goals in the following areas, which is what I'm going to describe shortly, that span across different facets of your life. So one area could be career and learning. 
Another could be physical and emotional wellness. Another family and other relationships. Another finance and wealth building. Another is spiritual growth and then leisure and lifestyle. So how do you get started on creating a personal vision? So step one is around getting the clarity on your life's direction, which can seem like a really daunting exercise. So you could consider the high level goals that you have for your life in the next, call it five years. And I'm opting for this time frame because it's far enough into the future to commit to something significant in terms of goals, but it's not too distant that they might seem woolly or unrealistic. And you could start by asking yourself some prompting questions like, what is the legacy that I want to leave behind? When I spent my time on this earth, what do I want people to be saying about how I interacted with them? What do I want to have done with my time that is meaningful to me? And if I speak more specifically to the areas that I described, the dimensions that I set out earlier, you could be saying, for example, for career and learning, what new skills do I want to acquire in the next five years? What concepts would I like to master over that time period? For physical and emotional wellness, you could be saying, what fitness goal would I like to achieve? Or how would I ideally describe my mental health in five years? For family and other relationships, what would I like my loved ones to say about the time they spent with me at the end of that five year period? For finance and wealth building, what financial progress would I like to have made in five years time in relation to saving, earning, borrowing, or spending? For spiritual growth, what progress would I like to have made in my spiritual life in five years time? And for leisure and lifestyle, how, how would I like to be spending an ideal week in five years time? So some people opt to represent the answers to these questions visually, and if that's you, go for it, because that will help to remind you what it is that you're aiming to do. And as you articulate these goals, please do not underestimate the power of articulating these goals in words or in pictures. A number of my own life milestones have come about because I did this. And in some cases, I forgot that I'd done that and then achieved these things down the line, came back and found them written down and realized that in the meantime, they've been driving me subconsciously. So step two is really about breaking down the journey. Because if you keep that personal vision at the goal level, you might find it difficult to take actions. So it helps to go a layer deeper. And I'll actually talk about a few layers. So this is about milestone markers. This is where you create some concrete milestones that align to your goals. So for example, if for one of your career and learning goals, you said, I would like to have defended my PhD in five years, then a concrete milestone could be, my PhD proposal is submitted in six months time. Then what you want to think about is, what are the milestones that I need for this journey in the short, medium and long term? And this might feel a little bit like creating a project plan for your life. And then, Moving on to step three, this is where you get ready for action. This is about assigning actions to all of those headline milestones. So for example, a possible short-term action could be, I want to define my central PhD question and my approach to answering it. There is a fourth step, which is around habit formation, but this is really helpful once the first three have been solidified. So I encourage people not to get stuck into the habit formation phase before really being clear about what it is that they want to achieve in the earlier stages. So there is a concept called identity-based habits. And the author James Clear is an expert on the topic of habits. And he considers goals to be less effective than the formation of habits. My own view is that they work hand in hand and habits are the layer that really supercharge the goals. So James Clear says that the key to building lasting habits is focusing on creating a new identity first. So I'm going to share some ideas from one of his articles. 
He believes that your current behaviors are simply a reflection of your current identity. What you do now is a mirror image of the type of person that you believe that you are, consciously or subconsciously. So in order to change your behavior for good, you need to start behaving new things, believing new things about yourself. You need to build what he calls identity-based habits. And there are three layers to this process. <clears throat> the first layer is about changing your outcomes. So this layer is concerned with changing your results. So that could be, I want to lose weight. I want to publish a book. I want to win a championship. And most of the goals that you set are associated with that level of change. The second layer is about changing your process. So this is concerned with changing your systems, implementing a new routine at the gym, changing your habits, things like decluttering your desk every morning, developing a meditation practice. And most of the habits that you're going to build are associated with that level. And then the third and deepest layer is about changing your identity. This level is concerned with changing your beliefs, your worldview, your self-image, your judgments about yourself and about others. And most of the beliefs, assumptions, and biases that you hold are associated with this level. So outcomes are about what you get, processes are about what you do, and identity is about what you believe. And when it comes to building habits at last, when it comes to building a system of 1% improvements, he calls them, the problem is not that one level is better or worse than the other. All the levels of change are useful in their own way, but the problem is we want to get you moving in the direction of change. And many people begin the process of changing their habits by focusing on what they want to achieve. And that leads us to outcome-based habits. But the alternative is to build identity-based habits. And with this approach, we start by focusing on who we wish to become. So I might say, for example, I want to be a more spiritual person. And then I will start to define habits that get me to that destination. And I can start to think about the identities associated with the goals that I'm setting in my personal vision. So you might be thinking to yourself, what the bleep does this have to do with money? And the short answer is everything. Many of your goals will have financial implications. So if indeed you're planning that holiday home for your 50th birthday or private schooling for your brilliant daughter, or you want to afford full-time care for an elderly parent, all of this is going to require financial resource and planning. Now, a good financial planner is gonna sit with you and want to understand not only your needs for your mortgage financing or your insurance coverage for your family, but also how to help you design your finances to enable you to bring your goals to life. I know so many people who want to retire in the South of France, for example, but nowhere in their spending or saving does this goal feature or people whose dream it is to take their entire family on a cruise, or perhaps it's the Ivy League University to which they want to send their children, or the new business they want to start, but they haven't really thought through how to meet their expenses as they embark on this new adventure. So it's very important that you link back the goals to how you're going to enable them. So once you have an idea of your aspirations, how about taking your personal vision with you to your next financial strategy session with your advisor. If you and your spouse or your spouse are financially adept, you can figure out which of your goals are actually feasible given the resources that you have, or even better, what you can do to create the resources that you need to bring your goals to life. The same concept applies to time as it does to money, by the way. You know, can you realistically achieve all that you've set out to do and what you wish to prioritize in your life. Saying, I want to spend time with my family and then committing to run a side hustle, write a book, start a business, all of this at the same time is counterproductive to your priorities. So you'll need to think about the trade-offs that you want to make. If you want that holiday home in the South of France, 
perhaps that ultra fancy SUV will be replaced by an equally functional but less costly one. So there's been a lot of financial wisdom imparted over the course of this conference, which can really help you in designing your goals. And I hope that you will be letting that sink in as you go through. So how do you stay on track once you've decided to create this personal vision? Firstly, I would suggest having regular check-ins and revisions. Things in life don't remain constant. So setting aside a few hours to do this every few weeks in the absence of other distractions, and before you know it, you're going to have defined and updated your roadmap towards your life ambitions. Once you have defined a plan and you're happy with it, you can ask yourself the following questions. Is the way that I'm designing my life, is the way that I'm going about life in line with my future aspirations? Am I taking those steps towards my goals that I wished I would? Who do I need to hold me to my goals? Secondly, linked directly to that question, you could be saying to yourself, who could be an accountability partner for me? Some people really enjoy the idea of having somebody walk beside them and hold them to the promises that they make to themselves. Thirdly, coming back to habits. James Clear says that unless you form sustainable habits, you will focus less on single accomplishments and more on incremental improvements. So you want to be 1% better every day, which counts for a lot in the long term. In a year, in fact, that is 37 times the improvement from where your starting point began. And the maths works, believe me, I checked it. It works a little bit like compound interest in your bank account. If you keep building on the money you have saved day by day, your interest gains interest. So coming back to the idea that we anchor our habits in our desired identity, the more we act in accordance with that identity, the more that we prove to ourselves that we are who we want to be. So this is what we need to remember as we set those habits. Who is the person that I want to be? And how do I prove that to myself with those small wins? Fourth, as you encounter new opportunities, you can test whether they fit with what you've decided is meaningful in your life and has priority. If you're offered a job in the oil and gas industry in Sweden, you could say, that really is something that sounds exciting, but according to the goals that I've defined for myself, I'm not sure it fits. And perhaps your plan needs updating because the opportunity is so wonderful and you hadn't thought about it, but it does prompt certain questions that you may not otherwise have considered. And lastly, if you have a spouse or a close friend, somebody you trust, you may want to compare notes and see where your plans diverge if you're planning to do things together. And it's certainly a great way to communicate about the future. So to close, I'm encouraging you to clarify what matters to you and what the goals in your life imply, not least because they'll keep your efforts and energies true to what you desire in your life. In my coaching practice, I help clients to ask themselves those searching questions and to identify what they wish for their lives. I've helped many clients articulate their personal visions they do find step one the most challenging and that's really setting out those headline goals. So together we've been able to clarify their life's mission, clarify the legacy that they wish to leave in their personal and professional lives. And if that is of interest to you, feel free to contact me. I believe Tendai will be sharing the details for those who wish to find out more. And I'll end with another reminder not to attach to outcomes, but rather to invest in the present. And it's a quote from authors Charlene Billitz and Meg Lundstrom in The Power of Flow, Practical Ways to Transform Your Life with Meaningful Coincidence. And it goes, when you are unattached, you have inner freedom. You have no investment in a particular outcome. And so you do what is necessary in the moment. You explore every option and are receptive to all new information. You do all that you know to do and then trust because you have no attachment to either the result or how the result is produced. So thank you very much for listening and I'm very open to your questions. Whoa, <laughs> Marge, you just took us on a, uh, 
an upgrade literally in our thought process why we do the things that we do how that fits in with our lives um thank you so much um for such a well of wisdom that you you just downloaded in a few minutes um <laughs> You know, it's no wonder you're a coach. Coaches, by the way, everyone, if you want uh, someone, if you want to shift, one of the best ways to do that is having a coach or a mentor who can take you from where you are to where you want to be. You know, if you, it just eases the journey and, and, and you're a leadership coach and I can, I can certainly hear that wisdom um, of experience coming through. Does anyone have any questions that they would love to ask Marjorie, this is a, a a woman that we would ordinarily not just get. So, so privileged to have her here, as with all our other speakers. You know, they're busy in their careers, in their field. But for today, for this weekend, yesterday and today, they've come down to our level to listen, uh, you know, to, to impart what they know. So, does everybody want to ask a question? You've got your five minutes with Marge. <laughs> Go on. What were the books and authors you mentioned? You should have been taking notes. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the um, people I mentioned was a gentleman called Ram Das, R-A-M-D-A-S-S. And then the book that I quoted at the end is called The Power of Flow. But there are many, many authors on this topic and lots of people who talk about this idea of detachment or, or not attaching to outcomes. It's a very simple concept in reality, but so, so challenging to practice because the way that we've grown up and the way that we exist is all about attachment. So you have to remind yourself constantly. It applies as much to emotions as it does to outcomes. Mm. So when something happens to you, do you hold on to it? for the rest of the day, or do you choose to do something else with it? An example is um, the other week I was driving and I tried to overtake a vehicle that had slowed down because there was an obstruction on the road, but after the obstruction, they didn't speed up again. And I thought, okay, well, they want to maintain the speed, I'm going to overtake them. Well, they decided that they didn't want to be overtaken and they started accelerating. And so I'm in the other lane and a heavy vehicle is coming towards me and it would not be able to brake in time for avoiding an accident. Mm -hmm. So I had to brake harshly and then go back behind this vehicle. And I thought to myself, so I can choose to be very annoyed with this driver. I can choose to curse. I can choose to you know, pump my hooter and, and make a, a fuss about it. Or I can choose to say, well, that was a close call and uh, I'm lucky to be alive. I'm glad I'm gonna let go of whatever bitterness I feel in terms of the action that he took and Lord knows why. I'm gonna go buy myself a coffee and have a nice afternoon. Mm -hmm. That's a choice. That's letting go of an emotion. And in every day we have the opportunity to do that. Wow. That's I can see some questions, I yes, think. Yes. Um, Someone says, uh, do you have a LinkedIn profile to connect, Calvin, or to connect? Yes, I do. And I can pop that in the window shortly. And guys, literally, if you get the upgrade, uh, ultimate upgrade bundle, which is part of um, the, the offer that's available during this conference, you get 220 pounds discounted coaching sessions with marjorie from her normal rate so you can imagine having five sessions of coaching um invest in yourself <laughs> invest in your upgrade um you know it, it's sometimes just that little tweak um will literally change your game um someone says uh marjorie when you're setting goals and set out to uh different steps to achieve the goals while practicing the power of flow how do you manage negative outcome so you've you've addressed that in the last question i think it? it's a great question though because this is what we stumble over mm. we get caught up in the negative outcome and think that's it you know this is not working mm. that is part of your journey mm. that is happening to teach you something mm. and you choose what you take away from it mm. so if you see it as this is a roadblock and i can't go any further so be it if you see it as this is a lesson for me and something that 
I'm going to use in my life hereafter, mm -hmm. then you can take it in that frame. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that it's not normal or it's not okay to feel down about something that doesn't go your way. I'm just saying it's your choice how you frame it and how you move on from it. Wonderful. We had a very good example of that yesterday during the conference, Marge. You, I, I don't think you were there yesterday, but um, uh, things were not working. The sound wasn't working and suddenly I had to take over <laughs> control of everything. <laughs> and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, when you have not signed up to do something and it's like, I have to do this now um, and a bit frazzled. And then I thought, hold on, this is an upgrade conference. Um, and in faith world, we say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. I've got the strength to do this. Um, and so it became one of those moments where, you know, I said, all things are working together for good because now I know I can do it. And so yes. where someone wasn't there to well step done. in, I managed to <laughs> rise up to the occasion and did it. And today, I wasn't panicking. I'm like, yeah, we can do this. Yeah, <laughs> you know? If it happens, I've got it. Yeah, thank so you. relax. So thank you for that. And um, but, oh, so there was a question before that I missed. Um, yes, yeah, so I think that's did um, you use a similar question, perhaps. Yeah, did you use a similar approach to start your own business and leave mainstream employment? Yes, absolutely. And here's the thing. I had this voice in my mind for years telling me that this was not my path, mm. but I ignored it. Mm -hmm. because my rational mind told me this has to be my path. I mean, what do you do if you're not climbing the corporate ladder? That's how I was raised. My father was the ultimate corporate guy. That's what I saw growing up. My programming was I will get promotions and I will follow a career in a good profession with security and stability and predictability. And every couple of years, I would say to myself, this is just not gelling for me. And then I'd say, but you're doing so well at it. Why would you leave it? And this happened. The cycle went on for many years. And eventually I reached a point actually where I was pushing burnout. And I was flying between South Africa and the UK on a biweekly basis, sometimes for one night, sometimes for the day. And it just wasn't working mm. health wise. And I had a choice to make. And I decided that now was the time to take the step that I'd been running away from for so long. And I said to myself, if I can help organizations to be successful, if I can fundraise in the capacities that I've been in, if I can make that happen for other organizations, why would I not be able to make that happen for myself? Mm. And at the time that I left my work, I had nothing really uh, by means of falling back onto something. Um, I was busy serving my profession and that was my focus for a while, but inevitably things started to work. Mm. And the, the non-executive roles that I thought that I would do much later in my career started to open up for me. And I started to get clients to consult with. And eventually I decided that I was gonna formalize my coaching practice, which is something that I'd been doing kind of informally for a number of years. So it was, a wake up call that I needed. And I listened to that voice that I'd been running away from for so long. And you're looking amazing at 5 a.m. in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Clearly flowing, you know, flowing. That is amazing. Um, thank you so much. Anyone else? Someone says, you've cleared my mind so much. Thank you. That's amazing. Oh, wonderful. So there's, um, a question from Vicky, I think I'll just touch on very briefly. I know that we don't have a lot of time, um, which says, as a business or community leader, what processes can I easily introduce to my organization to change mindsets and strategize towards group development? It's quite a chunky question, so I'm happy to chat offline if you'd like. Um, but what I would say is thinking beyond yourself. Mm. So when we work in groups, we don't work for our own benefit or our own agenda even though our inclination might be to protect our own turf or to protect our own deliverables or indeed to get credit for our own deliverables. Mm -hmm. The idea is that you're working together to create something for the greater good. Mm -hmm. So how do you build practices that de-emphasize individual credit and input and emphasize the ultimate goal? It's a tough thing to do, but I think if more teams and if more groups were able to think that way 
then they would collaborate more and deliver even greater results. Mm. Wow, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Marge. Um, that was amazing.